I'm Kirsten Klees van Dam. I'm the lead of the Computational Science Initiative at Brookhaven National Lab. Um, one of our activities is quantum computing. I myself am not an expert in quantum computing, but I'm very interested in algorithm design generally, and so, so this is a session that's close to my heart. Um, our session is quantum algorithms and programming environments, and this is really trying to answer the question where we, if we had a quantum computer, what the hell could we do with it? Uh, what, what are the things that, that can we do better on a quantum computer, but also for answering the question for people who are used to classical computers, um, how do we program these quantum computers? How do we change our algorithms? What can we do better? Uh, how, what can we do different? How do we combine the two? with those to, to um, pos with quantum computers and classical computers. Um, we have a great panel here today, and we're setting the session off with a talk from Su Shi Wei. Uh, he's an associate professor at the C.N. Yang's Institute for Theoretical Physics, and he's going to talk about his efforts in quantum algorithms. Thank you, Kirsten. Uh, can everybody hear me well? Okay, uh, okay, here's slides. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about algorithms and how you really program a quantum computer and then run it. Um, so I'd like to acknowledge the support of NSF and uh, our quantum center in planning. Uh, I got a cool, actually, laser. It's, they call this lightsaber. <laughs> So I will be uh, starting with this slide that we all know that Moore's law is the underlying key that propel the economy growth and industry development over the many few decades. And if you extrapolate this trend, you see that actually it would run to some end because of physics, the limit of physics. That means uh, a, a transistor would hit the size of a few atoms in maybe 20 years, and this signals that we could probably not keep going the industry as we're doing now. The technique has to be uh, reinvented. So this means that the region of quantum is inevitable. And this is actually a lot of people, including a, a few uh, people here and the keynote speaker, they have already thought about this a long time ago, a few decades ago, about how we actually take advantage of things, the world being quantum. How are we going to use the quantum rule to actually process information? So that's the motivation of this field of quantum information science. And fast forwarding, I'm going to talk about quantum computing. So I show you a list of current prototype of quantum computers from a few companies, from IBM, Intel, Google, Ligati, Ion, Q, D-Wave, et cetera. So this actually is something that's not really far enough. It's already approaching us, and we should take advantage of that, and we should get ready for the quantum era. So let me uh, step back and give you a, a bigger perspective uh, and tell you the four pillars of quantum information science. This is according to uh, the European quantum flagship. They gave a, a description of what should be the key ingredient in quantum information science. I list here four of them. Quantum communication, Eden has talked about that last session. And today I'm going to focus more on quantum computation. And you will see also talk by quantum simulation. And the other is quantum metrology and sensing. So since I'm going to talk about this, these are the things that I listed in the quantum computation that should be of importance, but also because I have limited time, I'm only going to focus on algorithm and how you program them. Okay, but I want to start off with uh, architectures, a way, different ways of thinking quantum computations. So, the first and the most standard way is the so-called circuit model. I will explain this in greater detail later. But this is a measure scheme uh, used by many labs, including IBM, Intel, Rigetti, IonQ. And the second one is so-called adiabatic quantum computation. This is approach that is used by D-Wave. And the other is topological. This is approach used mainly by Microsoft. And Google uses a hybrid of, of one and three. Uh, I won't have time to talk about the detail, but just give you a, 
a picture of what it should represent. It. And the uh, fourth one is a very different one using measurement only, actually only local measurement, but it requires some entanglement as a resource. Uh, this is closer to my own research interest, but I don't have time to tell you more about that. It's used mostly in photonic system and also uh, trap ultra cold atom may be a dark horse in that direction. Okay, so this is the outline. So I'm going to start slowly, and because there are a huge spectrum of audience here, I'm going to start slowly and ramping up. There are some part that I mark as technical. If you don't understand, that's fine, okay? So I'm going to begin with rule of quantum mechanics. These are really basic rule. If you have not heard of it, it's very really simple. I'm going to use just three simple rules so you can understand quantum computing. And I'll tell you the building blocks of quantum computers and illustrate with a really simple quantum algorithm and a few later on in this second part. And in this part, I'm going to be focusing on how you're really programming that. And I will show you programs. It's okay if you don't understand the detail of program, but I'll just show you there, is a, there are a few uh, frameworks that you can, you can do programming and then run on quantum computers. In the end, I will summarize. Okay, so what are the rules that need to be obeyed by quantum computer? These are rules of microscopic worlds, so you need to know these rules. And there are only three that you need to understand in order to understand quantum computation. So first is superposition, second measurement, and third is how it evolves, it's unitary evolution. So I will give details. So superposition, so quantum bit, as already uh, mentioned by Eden in the previous talk, they made up two level system, it's just like a coin. I just bought a coin here. It's either head or tail, but it's more than head or tail. And they can be uh, electron spin off, photon polarization that Eden mentioned, could be ground state and excited states of an atom, could be anything that you, you know it's a two level system and they have coherence. And, but they are more than zero and one, they can add, so like vector you can add them. So that's why we call it superposition. This is just showing an example. We usually use a ket or bracket just to indicate that it's a quantum. And you can put them and add them together. It's like adding vectors. So here's another one, study more complicated, the coin of head with some coefficient and head and the tail with some other coefficient. Uh, the reason I list this one because it has nice representation in what we call block sphere. Uh, these are the two angles associated with uh, vectors. It has a visual representation of, of a vector. Okay, and measurement. Second rule is measurement. So measurement, uh, I've discussed here, are strong measurements. Uh, strong measurement collapse the wave function what, what does that mean? So suppose I have a coin which is in a superposition of head and tail, and if you perform measurement, uh, it would occur probabilistically. So let me actually illustrate what that means. So I have a coin, and it's, it's spinning there, so let me just spin here. So this is a qubit. You don't know what that is until you perform measurement. So measurement is take your hand and collapse it, and then you see that this is, for example, it's, it's the head. Okay, so that's a strong measurement. Also, it's also destroyed the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> but they appear with some probability. Okay. So sometimes it may amplify the microphone. So that, that's the, the view of measurement. So you see this is the measurement process. And at the end of the measurement process, it gives you head or tail, okay? Uh, but in quantum mechanical world, actually it, it can be weird. I can actually project the coin into a superposition of head and tail. And this is what you cannot do classically, okay? And evolution, the third rule is evolution. Evolution is unitary. If you have learned algebra, linear algebra, then you know matrices. And 
basically evolution according to quantum mechanics is unitary, meaning that you just apply a unitary matrix to a vector. So here's my uh, lousy rendition of this process. You have an arrow representing this qubit, and if you have just one qubit, you can rotate it by applying some gate uh, along some axis with some angle. This is called one qubit gate. It's basically a rotation on the box of fear. Another example is I've, I have a coin head, and I flip to Dow. Uh, this is called not gate. Another example is uh, the so-called Hadamard gate. It basically is put a coin, a coin in head state, and then turn it into a superposition. This is called Hadamard gate. And if you have more than one qubit, suppose you have two qubit, and how do we apply them? There are some gates. Uh, but there only, there's only one you need to know, then you know everything. This is called control not gate. You probably already have that in classical computer science. Control not gate is that if you have two qubit, two bit, and if the first bit is zero, you do nothing to the second bit. If the first bit is one, you simply flip. So that's why it's called control not, because it's controlled by the first bit and you flip. So it's control not. Uh, what does a control not uh, do? It actually creates entanglement. Suppose you have these coin state uh, in this superposition, and you apply these control knot. It actually gives you this bell state that Eden mentioned earlier. So this is the circuit. Uh, this you start with these head and head, and you apply the Hadamard and get this superposition, and you will apply the control knot. It generates entanglement in this bell state. And we all heard about what Bell State can do, so I won't not tell you much along that direction. So what I want to tell you is, it's maybe my view of what quantum computer is. This is a computer uh, with cloud over it, so that's a quantum computer in my view. And you want to know what it's doing. You take a microscope, a amplify, and to see what it's running. So what quantum computer is doing after knowing all these gates it's actually initializing qubit in some standard state, and then you keep applying a sequence of gate to these qubit. And that's actually the, a fairly good way of understanding the quantum computer. And there's an important fact from mathematics. Only one and two qubit gates are universal. Universal in the sense that to build such a large circuit, you only need three particular Lego pieces. You can use more, but these three are essential. Uh, the two are one qubit gate, uh, Hadamard, you have seen that, and also the T gate. And the two qubit gate that you need, this is the only one you need, is C naught. So you only need three, these three Lego pieces, and you just lay on these circuit lines that build you a quantum computer. Okay, that really is the essence of standard circuit model. OK? So I want to move on and to tell you about quantum algorithm, some of the basic idea. So consider that I have uh, two register. So for example, x could be n bit of 0 up to uh, 1, and b is another register. I have some circuit that it does is it compute the function of f with argument x, and then add it to this second register. Okay, so this is just a rule. Let's this, this just treat it as a game. I have two input, x and b. After that box, the first input remained the same, but by the second input, I added a functional evaluation of x. Let's consider we have this, and let's just see what it gives us. So I mentioned superposition, so you mean, I'm, that means you can put all the state add a state together, so I add 0, 1, 2, et cetera, right? And the second bit, I use, uh, second register, I start with 0, and apply these uh, rule. So meaning that f 0 and 0, sorry, 0 and 0 would can map to 0 and f of 0, 1, f of 1, et cetera. So this represents a huge entangled state, a huge entangled state of the argument and the functional value. 
right? So this means that inside the quantum computer, it knows everything. It knows the functional value, input and output, but in a big superposition or big giant entangled state. So this sort of represents potential power of quantum computer. Okay, so that's the intuition that a quantum computer may be powerful. However, there's a catch. In order to read out, you need to perform measurement. So as I said, measurement basically collects the wave function, right? So what that means is, suppose I measure this first register, I might get k randomly because it's a probabilistic process, as I mentioned earlier. So I might get k or I may get 2. And then the second register will give you the functional value of 2, basically give you f of 2. And that may not be more useful than a classic computer, right? I can just compute f of 2. Uh, but quantum computer at this time actually perform worse because it's probabilistic. If I want to, too, but I just compute using classic computer, but it can only give me that with some probability. So that's a kind of drawback or uh, a dynamic that we have to make. So in order to actually make quantum computer powerful to re reveal the important information, you actually need to be smart. For example, you can measure in different bases, or you can measure in the second register. So for example, if you measure the second register and then you obtain the value f of 0, that means you collapse the state of the first register to all those arguments that evaluate to f of 0. So you can actually know the functional property by uh, performing measurement in a smart way. Okay. okay, so I want to actually give a, a concrete example. I want to make sure that I have enough time to do that. So imagine that I'm only consider uh, a function that map one bit, 0 and 1, to another bit, 0 and 1. And so there are only four possibilities. Right? So these f of 0 is 0, f of 1 is 0, or it could be 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1. So there are only four possibilities. Uh, but you can actually characterize into two different categories, for example, and this, uh, these two functions, they are constant, so it doesn't matter what uh, 1 or 0, it's always the same. The second group is that they differ by 1. So I'm only considering binary addition, so, so they differ by 1. So I call this bal uh, constant and this group balance. Okay. So the question is, uh, I want to ask, if I give you this box, is a function balanced or constant? Okay. The upshot is that a uh, classic computer, you really need to have two evaluations because this question is equivalently is a sum of the two function values. Okay? So definitely, classic computer, you need to two evaluations. But for quantum computer, you only need one. So this sort of indicating quantum computer can be powerful. So in the next few slides, I'm going to e explain how this works. OK, so this is the same box that we use. I want to uh, present a useful observation. So in the previous slide, I sent uh, in 0 here. But now if I send in 0 minus 1, I want to see what comes out. So you see that if it's 0 minus 1, then the second argument uh, becomes f of x, f of x plus 1. And they, because this is one bit of function, this is either 0 or 1, or 1 or 0, right? So I can just formally write, I, if f of x is 0, then this is 0 minus 1. So this is sign is, uh, is plus 1. But if this is 1, this is minus 1. So I'm just right in a really deep, looks like a deep way to, to represent something sim simple. Uh, but this sign, I can actually put in front of that, because it's just a sign, it's just a constant. I can move anywhere I want. Uh, this is called phase kickback. There's a phase here. I kick back to the first register. So that means I can actually, in terms of analysis, I can forget about the second register. I can just focus on the first register. Okay. Now uh, this is actually the algorithm that uh, proposed by Deutsch. 
So suppose uh, we stand in a fixed state, minus state, here. But the first register, I now stand in a zero plus state. And according to the phase kickback, there's a phase associated with a value f of zero, a phase with uh, f of one here, right? If they are the same, then this is a plus. This is still plus. If these two are different, there's a minus sign. Right? You see the dramatic difference. This is plus and minus. And the quantum computer, you can measure in this uh, basis plus and minus instead of 0 and 1. Right? So I told you that you can actually make measurement that project into coin head plus minus tail. Okay? So if we measure in this basis, then one shot that I know this function is constant or balanced. Okay? So that's kind of cool, and that's actually the first indication that quantum computer can be useful. And there are more development after that, so I won't be able to cover everything, so just show you there's actually a zoo of quantum algorithm you can visit online. And the notable one I want to mention are shows factoring algorithm and Grover's search algorithm. And as well as another one that uh, uh, our keynote speaker, Professor Loy, has contributed, is it's called Quantum Algorithms for a Linear System. Some of these uh, actually achieve exponential speed up. Okay? So this is a very technical slide. I don't hope to go through that. I want to tell you the, uh, basically the essence of Scholes algorithm that used to factorize a large number. So this is the slide in its full essence. But the key point is this. This algorithm uses what I mentioned, you, if you can measure in a smart way. For example, you measure the second register. Then the first register would collapse to a, a periodic pattern. And if, because of this periodicity, if you use a, a smart way, it's using what's called quantum Fourier transform, you can actually extract these R. And this R is the essence of extracting the, the factors. Okay, so this is as much as, as I can go. Okay, but if you have questions, you can ask me later. So instead of going through the detail, I want to show you the comparison of the complexity. So currently, the best uh, classical factoring algorithm is uh, super polynomial. It's not quite exponential, but it's super polynomial. And the Schultz factoring algorithm is polynomial through the third power. So I want, to f I want to compare. So I, want to, I assume that a classic computer take one uh, second to factorize 40, 74 digit. Uh, this is probably an uh, underestimate. And I, I also assume quantum computer can factorize 30 digit in one second. This is probably an overestimate for the technology we have right now. But let's just take the number as it is. And you see that even just 100 digit quantum computer is going to beat classic computer, right? And applying to 400 digit number, uh, classic computer would take twice the age of universe to factorize. But a quantum computer take less than one hour. So this is the promise that we are given just based on quantum mechanics. If we have such technology, you see that we have a lot of power. Uh, the government and military and all agencies are interested in this because these break some encryption scheme. Okay. But Eden already mentioned that we can counter that using quantum communication. Okay, so I'm moving to the second part about uh, programming environment. So currently, uh, there are a few industries that offer really cloud computing. Uh, there are also simulator, classical simulator. You can run on your desktop. You download the software, and you can actually run simulations. So I want, let me start with something that Eden talked about, teleportation. So basically, teleportation using this entangled source, Bell state, that we have seen earlier. And also in Eden's talk, he used HH plus VV. I use 0, 0 plus 1, 1. So if you have such a Bell state, a uh, shear between here could be the Earth, there could be the, mo uh, the moon. And you can actually use it to send unknown state. So what it does is that you want to send this unknown state. You sort of reverse the circuit. So this is the sort of reverse of this circuit. 
you run it backward, if, and then you perform measurement here, if this is zero, zero like that, zero, zero, then the upshot is that this is, this is your unknown state. But because the measurement is probabilistic, that's the rule number two that I mentioned earlier, you need to correct the other outcomes. And it turns out you can actually correct the outcome by knowing what you measured and be able to actually produce the entirely the unknown state from the Earth, it could be here, and to the moon without actually sending the physical object. Uh, this is uh, some program blocks from the Q shop, Microsoft. You see that it, it's just translating the circuit. H here, C not here, there, and C not message, and here, and if the measurement is one, I do something. Measurement of this is, is one, I do another thing. Right? So at the moment, the programming lang language mostly is really some kind of like assembly. You're just translating the circuit. Okay, so uh, the next, I want to show you uh, some cloud quantum computer by IBM. This is a list of what they have. Uh, I want to actually uh, introduce another algorithm. This is called Grover algorithm. I don't have time to tell the detail, but I can give you some intuition. Suppose there are 16 items that I want to find. Among them, two and seven are what I want to know, what I want to find out. And what you do is you send in the superposition of these objects, and you put a minus sign on the two that are marked. And they do something called a reflection around the mean. This is the mean of those values. If you do a flip, you see that these two amplitude actually get amplified. If you do that more and more, it gets amplified more until it actually it lowers the amplitude. So, and if you know how many items you are searching, then you know the optimal time to stop. Okay? And then you will be able to measure at the, the optimal point. And these magnitude basically showing how much the probability you get to measure from that. Okay. So this is an illustration of two qubit Grover. It's basically a search of, of uh, among four objects to search uh, the one, the zero, zero. So I won't be able to tell you the, the detail, but this is initialized in the superposition of all four objects. And this is putting the minus sign, and that's doing the reflection, and that's measurement, okay? You can actually go to IBM's website. This is the web base, it's called Composer. You can just drop these gates on, this, on, the, on these lines, forming a quantum circuit. You could also use uh, the Python code, they call this Qiskit package. And these are the Qiskit code, uh, Python code. And this is what I run on the IBM quantum computer. You see that uh, ideally it should be 100% to get, find item 00, but I have some error. I think maybe uh, there will be some discussion from, from the panel about the error. Okay, so I won't have time to go to the detail of this, so maybe I'll just skip uh, quantum Fourier transform and the phase estimation. These are very important uh, quantum algorithms. If you're a scientist working on algorithm or developing uh, some uh, application, uh, you may be interested in this, and we can talk in more detail. Uh, that's another run on the IBM, but I, I want to uh, maybe spend one minute on this slide. So we are very grateful that uh, SUNY gave us some C grant to start a stepping a center, a SUNY Center of Quantum Information Science, Long Island. And you can see that uh, under this center, we have uh, people working on various applications, algorithms, uh, sensing, simulation, communication, that basically cover the four pillars of the quantum information science that I mentioned earlier. And we hope that by establishing the center, by keeping growing and with collaborating with other people on campus, like ISCS, uh, as well as uh, our great neighbor, Brookhaven National Lab. And they are also forming a, this is called Nexus Network with other uh, quantum group in Northeast region. I think this would actually enhance all the quantum information science research and, and technology development. And we also have some collaboration to industry, as you've seen earlier. And then we, uh, here at Stony Brook, we can take uh, the responsibility to educate other SUNY campuses. 
So let me end with my slides here. So I introduce you some basic building blocks of quantum computers. I explain to you why uh, intuitively it's, it's not easy to design an uh, efficient algorithm because um, you need to perform measurement and that brings some complications. I gave you some simple example of quantum algorithm. Uh, use some uh, platform on IBM and some uh, simulations on uh, Microsoft Sharp Q, Q Sharp, and, and I left out a lot of topics uh, due to the kind constraint, but I hope maybe the discussion of the panel would enhance that. So I will stop here and thank you very much for your attention. Um, we're now going um, to introduce the panel. Um, we're starting with, with Leila. Uh, hi, I'm Leila Harmazi. I've recently joined uh, the Computational Science Initiative at, at VNL. Um, my background is in quantum computing. I actually got interested in quantum computing as an undergrad, um, um, listening to a, a, going to a colloquium on quantum computing. Um, and. Uh, Having been uh, fascinated by quantum computing, like by, by quantum mechanics, like many undergrad phys like physics students who first take a quantum, quantum um, physics course, I was very interested by the idea that uh, quantum computers might give us a chance to reverse engineer nature and thereby understand quantum mechanics better. Um, and ever since I've been working on quantum computing, I've worked on um, uh, topological quantum computing that um, uh, Tsujay mentioned. Uh, uh, in, uh, and uh, the idea that you know, there are these, these interesting topological phases of matter, if, that if you actually sort of build qubits out of certain properties of these systems, then these qubits are essentially uh, decoherence-free, at least in principle, and therefore they can lead to um, very scalable quantum computers if we can actually sort of create them. Um, and this idea of topological um, quantum computing, uh, this is sort of the main manifesta manifestation of it in, in topological phases. Uh, but also the, to the idea of topological uh, phases can, can be as actually used in the idea of um, error correcting codes. Uh, so the best error correcting codes that we have right now, which is the surface codes, is based on um, the ideas of a, of a topological phase. Um, and uh, in, in, in addition to that, I'm, uh, also, I also worked on um, adiabatic quantum computing, which is another um, area, another sort of architecture for, uh, for uh, quantum computing, um, and uh, my interest in that, uh, so my interest in, in, in that field was that um, how does basically the, the sort of the, the comp if, if my um, uh, quantum uh, sort of adiabatic Hamiltonian dep belongs to a certain complexity class, if it's, it, if it's sort of uh, more complex, whether it's, it's actually a better um, quantum computer or not, whether it can actually sort of solve um, uh, certain problems more efficiently or, or, or solve a sort of a larger um, area of problems. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much how I do. <laughs> I'm Frederick Kristic from Institute for Advanced, for Advanced Computational Science, ICS. And uh, previously, I have been many years in Oak Ridge National Lab. So from the color of my beard, you can guess that uh, I have been doing many things in my life. So uh, I, I, had, uh, researched in, I have researched in the uh, field of atomic physics, uh, or in the field of molecular physics, photonic physics, surface physics, plasma physics, uh, biophysics, and the nanosensors, nanosynthesis, and uh, my current interest is in quantum computing. Uh, that interest resonated with the uh, uh, interest that has been growing in the uh, this environment in SBU, also in ICS. So ICS uh, started a topical group uh, that uh, uh, has about 25, 30 faculties and students uh, who uh, learn together who, on quantum computing, who brainstorm uh, each other, uh, who creates uh, 
subgroups uh, on research topics. Uh, now, why I'm here? Because uh, uh, we have a particular interest in uh, computing uh, unavailable uh, quantum computers like IBM, Rigetti, uh, IonQ, to be, and uh, uh, we study uh, their physical uh, principles, uh, their accompanied computer languages, uh, application software, quantum error mitigation, and uh, algorithm development. Now, error correction is especially uh, important in quantum computers because efficient quantum algorithms make use of large-scale uh, quantum interference. Uh, and uh, uh, this is a very fragile uh, effect, uh, sensitive uh, to um, in, uh, errors, sensitive to uh, some uh, imprecisions, and uh, this uh, could uh, destroy interference and therefore uh, uh, destroy the advantage of quantum computers in comparison to the classical ones. So uh, there are two way, uh, kinds of these errors. Uh, one uh, comes uh, from errors in gates, so unitarity uh, is um, uh, hurt. Another one comes uh, as a decoherence from the fact that uh, every, uh, each quantum computer is an open system, and uh, therefore it inter interacts, it couples to the environment, and that can completely destroy uh, its co coherence of the uh, entangled states. So that means uh, uh, that uh, large-scale quantum computation might be uh, quite uh, in dangerous position, uh, quite difficult, unless we find uh, proper ways to do error mitigation, um, or simply to make errors of each uh, gate in each computation step smaller than some threshold, uh, so that uh, uh, th that way uh, the computing can uh, reach arbitrary uh, accuracy. Uh, so what is the problem here? We have to uh, do error correction, but to uh, avoid uh, measuring individual qubits, because uh, uh, that will destroy the state, as uh, Tsu Chi uh, and Eden discussed. So we have to deal with multiple sources of errors, uh, bit flips, phase flips, uh, amplitude damping, phase damping, and uh, uh, because of uh, non-cloning theorem, uh, we cannot use what is in classical computing used, which is redundancy. So that cannot work, uh, therefore, with quantum computers. And uh, besides that, we have a continuous error caused by the rotations and uh, the coherence that uh, uh, is often unexpected it has to be handled somehow. So a number of different mathematical techniques have been developed, like fault-tolerant uh, protocols, like stabilizer codes, like uh, dynamic decoupling, and so on. Uh, but obviously we need more sophisticated and more efficient versions of quantum error correcting codes. Uh, I think the conclusion is that uh, uh, designing better error codes is one of the, ma uh, one of the ma major trusts uh, of the field of quantum computing, besides improving the hardware. <coughs> Thank you. Mike? Um, yes, I'm Michael McGuigan. I'm uh, at the Computational Science Initiative and in the Quantum Computing Group at Brookhaven National Lab. And uh, I'm, I'm very interested in the uh, 
the area of right now of quantum simulation. It was uh, that quantum computers are an ideal system for doing quantum simulation. This was an idea put forward by uh, Feynman, and uh, it was proved to be true by Seth Lloyd, who was in the audience in, in the 90s. And now we're at a point where quantum computers are actually here in the near-term machines, and we can try to put some of these uh, ideas into fruition. And uh, what I found in the early applications is that it's a very cross-cutting tool. You know, it can be used in condensed matter physics, uh, some of the applications Robert mentioned for, uh, for molecular and chem chemical systems. It could be used in uh, nuclear physics and high energy physics. Anytime we're doing quantum simulation, it seems like an almost ideal tool. But the limitations of the near-term machines, uh, not only do they have low number of qubits, but they also have a, a limited amount of, uh, of uh, circuit depth because of the decoherence factor. So when you're doing a computation, it's almost like you're trying to run across a bridge while the bridge is falling apart and trying to get to the other side. That means that you have to develop your algorithms which have very low circuit depth and try to, try to uh, obtain what's called quantum advantage. So quantum advantage means that if you use the best available classical computer to do your quantum simulation, uh, like a supercomputer, for example, which has now reached like exascale, uh, how does that compare with what you can do on a quantum computer? And if the quantum computer is faster and you get the same result to a reasonable amount of accuracy, then you said you've achieved quantum advantage. And we, we feel that uh, this will be achievable in the next year or so, on uh, uh, a year or two or so, on, on using uh, low depth algorithms, sort of the topic of what we're talking about here. Some of the algorithms we study are like the variational quantum eigensolver. We're act not actually calculating the eigenvalue, but you're calculating an expectation value. On a, very, on a variational state. So it's sort of a hybrid classical quantum algorithm. And uh, the, the, turn, the, uh, the crossover between quantum advantage seems to be like the 50, 60, maybe 100 qubit level, which is, a, which is achievable in, in the next two years. Rigetti has a proposal to do 128 qubit quantum computer. But it's not only the number of qubits, it's like I said, the depth of the circuit. That's a variable called quantum volume. You know, what, how deep can you go, and then how many, how many, uh, how many qubits can you entangle, which is of course related to, to the depth using the CNOT gate. So, you know, this is a very exciting time in uh, quantum computing, where we're able to uh, study cross-cutting problems on these near-term machines, and it's very exciting to see where we end up in the next few years. Thank you. Hi, I'm Annie Liu. Uh, I'm a professor in computer science here at Stony Brook. Uh, my main research area is uh, language, programming languages, and algorithms, and especially optimizations. And especially in the last 10 years, actually, languages and uh, algorithms for distributed computing. And actually, before that, uh, you know, AI and certain reasoning and all these machine learning things, that's very hot now. Um, but coming back to uh, programming languages and compilers, and uh, uh, algorithms in particular. Um, in particular, the, the thing I've been focused on for almost over 30 years or 28 years uh, is optimization as a unified and systematic method for optimization based on what we call incrementalization. It is actually exactly the discrete analog of differentiation and integration in calculus. Um, and so it allows us to uh, look at a, a wide variety of uh, um, language uh, features and applications, and including you know, basic examples in, since the very first uh, you know, Babbage difference engine, the ENIAC, the first computer, and, uh, and you know, database, the, the core of database queries, and the, you know, logic, and uh, even more recently, you know, solving uh, work on this. Uh, I mean, we do have, a, we think we have a solution for Russell's paradox, you know, computing these things efficiently and get what you desired. Um, but in particular, in distributed computing, uh, we're really interested in uh, working on you know, discovering invariance in distributed algorithms. And so we can work on creating and optimizing basically really based on functions, um, sort of the whole distributed description, system description as a function of processes and the message histories. Okay. And actually, my biggest interest in, in quantum was uh, um, uh, for 20 years, actually, uh, a professor at Cornell, a new enrolled, has been telling me, oh, you're working on math because it's all you know, differentiation and integration. Um, but after 20 years, he said, oh, you're working on physics. And that time, it wasn't for quantum computing. But he was saying, actually, he, he sent me this article he wrote called The Hidden Variables in, in Computation and Control, which describes program invariance. That's one we really look for and optimize uh, as the you know, conservative quantities 
in you know, Noether's theorem, right? The conservation of law in, in physics. And, uh, uh, but anyway, uh, we really uh, were fascinated actually last few years in doing distributed computing, we found a lot of analogy in terms of uh, you know, quantum thinking. And also Nirod was telling us, uh, okay, oh, you're doing these proof methods and it look like what is quantum physics doing, you know, think about absolute time. <laughs> So anyway, and uh, you know, uh, Professor Wei talked about these quantum programming languages, and that's really studied extensively in, in programming languages now, you know, in, not in, from everyday researchers, but in from all different corners and people doing different languages. And so in terms of uh, our method for doing optimization is really how can we liberate us, or not just computer scientists, uh, from low-level, tedious, uh, error pro programming, but focus on the creative part, right? So the high-level programming languages. Mm -hmm. And so I'm most interested in actually, it's not just the, of course, we'll help design languages mm -hmm. and uh, high-level abstractions, right? Loops and recursions and sets and whatever logic. Um, so that most programmers would have to know little, hopefully, about uh, quantum physics to, to program. But even for you know, people who know quantum physics, right, how do you focus on the creative part, right? understand the, the essence of uh, algorithm design for, for quantum systems and using whatever the algebraic laws and design that at a high level. So you know, make the best use of all the math in these models. My name is Vladimir Karipin. I represent the SUNY Center for Quantum Information Science on Long Island. One of the last uh, slides of Professor Wei was devoted to this center. Actually, I looked in the program. All four speakers of our quantum in immersion workshop today are from this SUNY Center. So we do a wide variety of things in the center. Among other things, we organize in December a conference on quantum entanglement and simulation. Um, well, quantum entanglement is a special relation between two quantum systems which cannot happen in classical. Well, physicists know this is quantum fluctuations. Uh, among other things, we were studying spin chains and starting from some error correcting codes, we designed, constructed new spin chain with unusually high level of quantum fluctuations. Coming back to Professor Wei lecture, we also work on quantum algorithms in the center. So among other things, uh, well, the first uh, quantum search algorithm was designed by Grover, Love Grover, but he considered databases the set as the least. So we want to exploit the topology and geometry of the database to accelerate the search. Um, I guess you will learn more about activities of the center from the, the next uh, speaker, which is 250 today, Dominic Schnebel, and also Dmitry Karzeev, both of them enlisted in the center. Thank you. Thank you. Um, as I said before, I'm representing the Computational Science Initiative at Brookhaven National Lab. Um, our interest as a uh, Department of Energy lab is really at the leading edge of, of sci large scale science. That means that we run a lot of simulations to, to uh, explore our theory research on the largest computers in the world. At the same time, we are the center that produce uh, the lab that has the, the largest amount of data. We have the largest scientific data archive in the US. Uh, last year, we processed 690 petabyte of scientific data. What that means for us is that we're always looking at the latest technologies when it comes to our simulations to get more out of them, but also in terms of data processing, what can we do to gain more scientific insights faster out of the data that, that are created by our large-scale experimental facilities. And so it was natural for us to look at quantum uh, to see what we can do, where can we really get this quantum advantage, for which application is it, is it worthwhile investing the effort and where should we stick with, with more traditional systems. And so one of the, exper the projects that we did jointly with, with Suchi was to look at uh, can we do, um, uh, can we bring state-of-the-art uh, machine learning algorithms on, on a quantum computer and what are the challenges in that? Uh, the error code is one of them, of course. Um, that, that's always a challenge. But it's also how do you get the data on? How do you get it off? Um, and so that uh, led to a whole area, a number of new areas of research that we're pursuing now, which, which I think will be very exciting. And obviously, we're working very closely with Eden because there's no point in just putting the data into the computer. We usually have to distribute it to many of our collaborators. So looking at new ways of distributing data 
um, faster potentially is, is another thing that we are very interested in. So um, now it's time to ask us questions. I, I hope you, you have some. We have a little bit of time, about five minutes, and so we have, can have a few questions. There's one there at the front. So hi, uh, I am come from the classical computing <laughs> background. Uh, and the school, uh, 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 we, uh, we took the computer architecture class, mm -hmm. the program language class. So when we talk about the computing, they'll talk about the CPU, uh, which usually have a, a, like a main frequency, right? It's a, a clock. And so every step, you the uh, basic the instruction was uh, is done, performed by the CPU. And on the line, I understand that the CPU, the basic is a transistor between one and zero. That's determining how fast the classical computer. But now, now we are going to the, this is the quantum computing. So we don't have any calls about the architecture of quantum computing. Nobody, I'm, and this I'm scaring because when we talk about quantum mechanics, you have a Schrodinger equation to solve. Everything is uncertain. You have Heisenberg uncertain principle, and everything is about prob probability. So my question is, uh, when you think about the one on a very fundamental level, uh, one state change the quantum state change one to another, and. Uh, so how fast it is, what determines the speed, how do you measure one state to another? Uh, so that's my question. So regarding the speed, uh, it depends on the physical system. Yeah. So it's, uh, for example, IBM, they use uh, superconducting qubits. Uh, their gate time is, I think, microsecond? Millisecond, yeah, yeah, microsecond. Maybe it's a mid. Well, all together, yeah, all together. individual gate. Yeah. Individual, yeah. yeah. So, and other systems may have faster gate, uh, depending on really depending on the physical system. So there's also the ion Q, they use trap ions and use uh, hyperfine states and Eden knows about the frequency of these. Yeah. I think that's one of the most amazing things about quantum computing. You, you, you submit a problem and it almost comes back instantaneously. It's scary. Whereas this thing where we're saying where you submit to a classical computer which would be doing the exact same problem, it could take a week of number crunching. It's, very, it's actually a uh, exponentially hard problem to simulate a quantum computer on a classical computer, depending on the size of the problem. So when we say we quantum advantage, we're not really taking into account the time to get back the result. We're just saying doing the, the calculation at all. So, so how do we know the state change and finish? So there are a few uh, tools you can use for, for example, something called quantum state tomography that you can use a uh, measurement to actually characterize what the state you prepare. And there's also something called quantum process tomography that you use to uh, characterize the process. And there's actually something called detector chromography that you can characterize detector. But all these can also be packaged in, in one self-consistent way to determine whether your state preparation is, is good, uh, the process of gaze are good, and the measurement. So, so we, uh, a lot of us in quantum information science have been developing tools like these. Yeah, so they are existing tools. And I think the uh, speed of a quantum computer is not necessarily measured in the, in the speed mm -hmm. of the gates, but it's more the number of instructions that you sort of need to, to calculate your problem, which, which is greatly reduced uh, in a quantum computer. From, from in comparison to a traditional one. I think that's where the real advantage is. You just need a lot less. <clears throat> there are other questions. Uh, yes, there's one. So, so uh, I'm Hubertus van Dam. I'm a computational chemist uh, by training. Um, I've had a, I have a question about decoherence effects. Isn't decoherence in itself a probabilistic type of thing? And can so you would measure a decoherent state with a certain probability, and I suppose that probability de increases uh, the further out you go in the, on the time scale. And can you detect when you have hit a decoherent state? So you, could you just measure something and then decide afterwards, oh, this result is not valid, I'll throw it out, for example. 
So maybe I'll answer this question. So uh, there are two types of things. One is called relaxation. So for example, you're, you're in an excited state, relax with the ground state. And another type is called decoherence, that you still, uh, you're in the, I mentioned this superposition, uh, for example, the head and tail in a coherent state, uh, but the decoherence uh, could ruin the cross product of zero and one, this, this off-diagonal element of density matrix. It, this magnitude would decay, and that's called decoherence. And so these can be detected, so you can use many, uh, uh, for example, these Renzi oscillations, uh, you can use some spin echo to measure that. These are already existing physical uh, tool that you can do. And, but you can also write in terms of quantum circuit. In fact, if you go to uh, IBM's website, these Qiskit, they have tutorial uh, for relaxation and, and decoherence. Uh, you can actually try that out and, and, and measure. But you have to actually, and you are right that uh, these processes are probabilistic. So you have to repeat the measurement many, many times to get enough statistics. Um, maybe I have a, I have a question for for the panel. Uh, if you could give a quick answer each, and say what what's the most um, um, pressing issue that you want to address in your research that you think that we need to solve to to make a big step forward in quantum algorithms and computing. Um, I, I kind of agree with but uh, Predict said I um, quantum, error, quantum error correcting co codes probably. Yeah, uh, so error mitigation uh, is the prime issue. Without that, we don't have computer, quantum computer. Yeah, I would agree. I would also add something like what Annie said, which is the... Uh, the programming environments to get more access to people because we really need more of these low depth algorithms to be developed. And the more accessible we have these, these uh, computers to be able to program them and, and access them at a high level, you know, libraries. So people are not really familiar with programming at the gate level in the classical computer. We're going back to that in the quantum computer. And people look, look at it and say it's like reading musical notes, but not everybody can read music. So, you know, it's uh, when I see an algorithm for quantum search versus a uh, a Grover algorithm versus a different algorithm, it doesn't necessarily sync with me. Whereas if I see like the Python script and, and looping and things like that, that's a language I understand. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, developing the high programming language is a very important part of this. And one of the reasons people are talking about the IBM and the Rigetti is because they have the, they have, they have the whole ecosystem where they develop this. So that, that's an important thing to keep an eye on. Well, thank you, Michael, for saying what I wanted to say. But, but beyond that, I do have one thing. Actually, I really want to understand, uh, you know, quantum computing at a scale, right? The quantum computer can be built in scale, but what kind of thing we're thinking when we program that to design algorithms? Well, evidently, we need more quantum algorithms and uh, also better hardware. But independently of this, I think it's important to concentrate on application of ideas of quantum information to other branches of physics. For example, there was recently exciting development of uh, applying ideas of entanglement to high energy physics like quarks entangled in the baryon. So I think uh, my interest is in the fundamental limit of quantum computation, how powerful quantum computation can really push us. Uh, but in a more practical sense that we are trying to achieve these, the so-called quantum supremacy, we want to demonstrate that quantum computer can do something that current supercomputer cannot do. Uh, so in order to do that, there are many scientists uh, working on that. So the concern is we need to develop an algorithm that are not long depth, as Mike says, short depth algorithm. There are a few existing ones, but we also need to know whether the quantum computer has done the correct thing. So in order to do that, we need to have a scheme to verify and validate what computer, quantum computer does. So that would also require classical computer to compare the lower size of, of system, comparing that we are confident that they are producing what exactly we can simulate and then extrapolating to, to a, a larger, bigger system. And we need to actually develop better validation schemes beyond what classical computer can, can actually simulate. Thank you very much. Un unfortunately, we are, 
we are at the end of our session. Um, there wasn't, as usual, not enough time to ask all the questions that everyone had. Um, I would encourage you during the break to go up to, to our panel members and our speaker and uh, ask them all the questions that, that you thought of afterwards, as it often is, and engage them. We're, we're all very interested in collaborating and exchanging ideas with, with all of you. Um, otherwise, let me uh, please join me in thanking the panel and the speakers. Thank you.